thanks everybody for coming here and thanks for inviting me. And I'm very happy that Ted had the lecture before I have it because you cl concluded with something which I um, somehow comes out in this, in this title as well. Um, I basically took the global title of the whole conference and actually tried to bring it down a bit more to kind of down-to-earth words uh, and concluded that Shenzhen is actually moving from sweatshop to a uh, livable city. Um, but this shouldn't be read as like either it's a sweatshop or it's a livable city, but it's actually very much about coexistence of two concepts at the same time. And that will come back in, uh, in a lot of things I'll be talking about. And I think that's one of the characteristics of this laboratory uh, condition you have, that, that constantly things actually coexist next to each other. Well, if you look at Shenzhen, um, and um, <coughs> probably most of you know this, this data, um, we are actually looking at an enormous... Uh, growth in wealth, uh, which has expressed itself in the development of a city, which basically was a rural area which turned into a city. But I think even more importantly, it actually has also uh, completely transformed um, the people that are actually living in this place. Actually, through the emergence of the city and through the DNA of the city, uh, that very much is an immigrant city, a machine that makes, um, um, makes actually city dwellers out of farmers. Uh, also, the, comp the, the entire pattern of what people expect, how people live, uh, what they're aiming for, what they're striving for in the future, uh, has changed. And the Shenzhen resident of today is not the Shenzhen resident um, it was 30 years ago. And uh, the new arrival in Shenzhen is not the same as the one who is living there for a year. And Shenzhen kind of keeps fulfilling this, this role of integration machine. So what we're seeing is actually a quite colorful, um, quite open um, uh, society, in a way an immigrant society for, for Chinese terms, even though uh, people come from China, but they come from very different regions of China, and on European scale we would definitely call, uh, uh, speak uh, of uh, immigration. But what this has led to is actually that um, you have a very colorful society, um, which um, in a way um, moved away from the rather sort of monolithic uh, model of, uh, of a communist society. But if you look at the planning system, there is still some work to be done. It's lacking uh, behind a bit. Um, and, um, uh, and that's actually being a planner, it's a constant struggle we are, we are facing, uh, not only working in China, but also working in other um, countries which have uh, or had are in a transition from a uh, from, uh, um, communist or socialist system into uh, something else, whatever that is. Now, I, this is a statement I want to make, um, um, that successful cities always mirror the needs uh, of the, and the ambitions of the people of the society that are actually living uh, in these places. Um, and not so successful cities actually don't do that. So, what have we seen? Uh, Shenzhen has tried to uh, live up to that. And there were, in a way, um, in the past, that's how I, that's my reading, um, kind of two phases. Uh, Shenzhen started off very much as a sort of, I call it copies king. You know, we kind of take concepts from abroad, we adapt them, and we try to kind of get something started. Then we entered in the uh, 90s, and I think the first decade of the uh, 21st century, uh, in a phase of rapid growth, where actually everything was about speed. And now we're at the point where people start questioning whether that's actually the right thing, and we're moving into something where um, it's much more about, you know, how can we achieve quality? And there is also, um, on top of the, of the um, sort of private personal motivation of people, there is also a clear, um, a clear uh, macroeconomic and also political agenda behind it, which means that uh, if you really want to move China as a whole and Chinese cities from one state they're in to another one, you really have to invest in, um, in talent, uh, in the development of talent, uh, and you only can invest in talent or you can only attract talent if you're actually investing in better urban environments because you're, as a city, not competing only on a Chinese scale anymore, but Shenzhen also starts really competing on a global scale uh, with a very strong competitor, uh, Hong Kong next door. The other is, um, and that has to do with, um, with the economic growth of uh, cities. <coughs> China, China as a whole and Chinese cities are entering in a stage where the sort of quick growth actually is not, uh, cannot be sustained anymore. Uh, now, if you don't invest in improving your city environment, you're actually, in a way, killing the growth potential uh, of the future. And I think um, a lot of uh, people and also the government actually um, local governments and central governments actually have acknowledged that there is some work to be done to 
um, sustain a degree of uh, growth. It's not as high as it was in the past, but they want to and have to sustain uh, a degree of, um, of uh, economic growth. And you can see this in, uh, in a serious thing, uh, things happening. Uh, the Biennale is one of the examples of like, you know, let's bring culture to a city. Um, the city was using and is using uh, large events to um, trigger certain investments and certain developments. They're not always successful, I would I have to say, but, um, but certainly for the infrastructure, it actually added quite some, um, some benefits to especially the, the metro system in Shenzhen that uh, got quite a significant upgrade in the, in the run-up to the, to the universiate. There's a lot of parks in, uh, in development, and uh, we're also involved in actually doing uh, one of them, Shangmi Park, which used to be an agricultural research center, which is now transformed into, a, into an educational um, agricultural landscape. So the whole education part actually gets included into the story of, um, of what Shenzhen used to be in the past. So it's, it's actually a historic place, um, but it, they try to load it with a new meaning. Quality of life in the city is um, good when the inhabitants are actually capable of dealing with the complexity they're dealing with. It's not for me, it's actually Richard Sennett uh, who said that. And I think the term complexity is actually one of the crucial uh, things we are, and Shenzhen is starting to really deal with in actually moving from the speed is king city to the quality is king city. Now, coming back to the planning system, we're dealing with a planning system which is lagging behind. It's still quite prescriptive, it's still quite uh, inflexible. Um, it is still a planning system which very much looks at, you know, it's plan-driven, it's two-dimensional. Um, it is, I th for, for, for our perspective, is relatively undetailed in what it kind of defines. Uh, and it's generally addressing the big scale. You're doing big plans and the plans are not very detailed, which leads to a certain um, result if you don't uh, watch out. What you also see is, and these are more technical things, there is not really a link between the urban scale and the architecture. So, um, you know, there is, you, you're defining red lines, and from the red lines you have setbacks, and then you have always these strange zones, um, which Europeans always find funny, because nobody really knows what to do with them. In the end, they are parking lots, so they're just nothing between the curbage of the street and the facade of the building. So this integration, which we know in Europe, is actually um, is not fully developed. I think what's also um, only about to emerge is tools for quality uh, management in the city. Um, and that, um, I think, has to do um, with, I mean, we, we know the Welstand in, in Holland and various other countries have other uh, systems to actually control that. Um, in China, these systems don't exist uh, to that degree yet. Um, and this is something which um, I think is necessary if you really want to manage a higher degree of complexity. Because it's not only plants that can solve the problem anymore. You actually need to talk with each other and you have to have people which are, um, where there's a certain consistency um, that actually um, make decisions or advise on decision making. The planning system in the past has always been um, top down with actually very little to no involvement of the public, at least in a direct um, and open interaction between, uh, between the two. Um, and that's also something which is still very much enshrined in the system. Now, we actually have to deal with that as planners. And um, instead of trying to change the system, which um, we probably will not succeed in, we decided to settle for actually developing um, pretty much in every project we're doing a sort of add-on to um, the system, which actually helps with dealing a particular problem uh, we're facing. And I'm going to show you a couple of them very quickly. This is uh, Guanlan River, a 15 kilometer strip uh, in, um, in Shenzhen, where we um, did a competition and won that to actually develop a master plan for that entire zone. Now, how we started was to say we're not doing a big master plan. We're actually doing a whole bunch of very, very small master plans. There are sometimes only like one blocks or two blocks, and sometimes they're a bit bigger. But it's actually a system, um, a framework of elements which we actually, um, which, which, which create a mosaic which we put together. Another project, and um, unfortunately case has left um, because we started working on that project together, is actually um, the regeneration of an area called uh, Sungang Qingshuhe, which was um, one of the first logistics centers of uh, Shenzhen in the 1980s, and which actually fell um, out of fashion and doesn't meet the scale anymore, and infrastructure is problematic. Now, 
when we actually um, went to that area, we were absolutely amazed, not so much about the architectural quality, there is not so much to be seen, but just about the life, because everybody has told us it's an abandoned logistics center, so you would think it's all empty, but actually it was not. We saw, and this is a, a sort of land ownership pattern of that area at the time, we saw a very colorful um, mix of things, and we found quite unique places, which, you know, this is kind of Shenzhen to a degree. This is a bridge, and underneath they put billiard tables, and people just um, have, their, have their sports events there. We found warehouses which we felt, you know, you can do something with them. You don't need to replace them necessarily. We found um, quite a bit of life, which actually led us to coining um, the, the, the text, what you see up here, that the area is actually um, too young to be historic, but old enough to be authentic. And I think that's what ultimately was important to us. How can we keep the authentic, the authenticity? It's not about individual buildings, but it's about people, it's about networks, it's about economic patterns that have been established uh, in the area. What we did, and that was still at KCAP, uh, we did framework master plan with all series of strategies that defined different aspects of the development. Uh, and <coughs> with my company, we actually went further and we're still working on this, but I'm just showing you how we try to also deal with various situations we have on that site. We said we want to keep as much as possible of the existing building stock and rather upgrade it, uh, put add-ons to, um, um, to densify the whole thing. Um, one thing you're always um, struggling with is how do you deal with, you know, what other called Shenzhen villages. Um, um, I would rather so call them uh, relatively cheap uh, residential neighborhoods. Um, there you always have the problem that when you do something to them, you have a process of gentrification, actually moving those people out, which actually are quite important for the liveliness of the place. So we developed a whole toolbox of things how we can, um, in a very cheap way, uh, improve the quality. And sometimes that's just paint, and sometimes it's a bit cleaning up, and sometimes it's, it's, it's about uh, planting uh, a couple of trees. And that's part of a master plan which we're, we're working on. And it's one of these um, sub-areas for, for the site. Um, um, and then residents and local activi activists can actually use that toolbox. And as money is available, as time is available, as, as people are actually willing to do it, they can start upgrading uh, the area. Another thing is, of course, these villages have deficits, um, sometimes quite large deficits. Transport is a or parking space is a big problem. Uh, there is no room for um, large retail facilities, social functions, open spaces, all these things. And this is, um, is an attempt which we're uh, still discussing. Uh, we called it village safer. So could there be a piece of infrastructure which actually contains all the things the villages can't provide in that way actually helps uh, saving them? I think another aspect of planning is actually um, and this comes back to the discussion around advisory groups, is actually interaction, an interaction between all the well, people, all the stakeholders involved in these uh, design processes. And this is also in the same area, and it's quite a nice story, because this was a competition, we won the competition, and then was the discussion, how can we actually finalize the master plan? We then said, well, let's do a workshop. Let's invite all the stakeholders and discuss what should be done. And the client said, no, no, we've never done, we can't do that. We can't invite people and it's never been done before, so uh, we can't do it. We said, well, why don't you just invite them? Um, we come here for free. We do it for two weeks. We work together with you uh, and the stakeholders and we kind of come to a, to a solution which um, hopefully to a solution which everybody supports. If it goes wrong, well, then it was an attempt. Um, you know, we came, we don't cost anything, for you there's very little risk involved, so uh, let's do it. And um, it was a big success, and it was not only a big success because um, a lot of people actually showed up, uh, because it was also a big success because, um, yeah, how should I say that, because um, there was a sort of mutual consensus reach, so this concept of, you know, reaching harmony um, and um, and somehow settling conflicts in a friendly way um, was actually something very successful and something the government in the end was very happy uh, to support. And we actually keep doing these things. And we also increasingly doing this um, between different um, um, 
between planners and designers on different uh, levels in the planning process. So this is a project we're actually uh, doing in Liu Shandong, uh, where Urbanist did the master plan. Urbanist is still involved as advisor uh, in the implementation of the architecture. So in an informal way, again, there is a system where, um, where there's a degree of quality control uh, emerging, which didn't exist uh, before. Yeah, I'm almost finished. Last um, example, I think, um, and I want to show is something which we are doing in um, Darwin, Utah, which is actually one of these, you know, last remaining pieces of land uh, which can be developed uh, within the city, where we're currently doing um, urban design guidelines. Now, that doesn't sound very revolutionary for, um, for the Dutch context, but uh, in Shenzhen, we found that's actually quite something uh, to bring a rather sketchy and rather rough plan to a level, to a higher level of detail, which we're doing at the moment. We start off with not looking at the architecture, but we start off, off with um, looking at the structure of the open space and how actually buildings relate to, um, relate to um, the public space. And we do this in various levels. The more important the place is, the more prescriptive actually the guidelines are. So this is one of the key spaces. We're talking about how streets look like, what frontages are, I mean, things you would actually discuss in, in, in the Netherlands quite, quite frequently and quite regularly, but things that don't really exist in the planning system today in, um, in, um, in Shenzhen or in China as a whole. Closing with, you know, also <coughs> defining um, uh, envelopes um, and having a de degree of zoning. So I want to conclude. Um, and this is basically how I see what, what the steps are and what, what Shenzhen is actually uh, about to, um, to do in the future. Um, what we also just heard, um, I think it's much more about building in than building out in the city. In other words, in other words regeneration, densification as far as that's possible, improvement of inner city infrastructure. Um, I think there is, um, and that's already going on, the shift from a pure production city to um, a service city. It doesn't mean that this, the production city will disappear, but the service city, and that's what you can see, gets clearly uh, more and more important. I still think, and in that sense, I don't really agree with Case uh, this morning when he said Singapore is the big model. I think Hong Kong is a much, much stronger model in, in the Shenzhen context. Uh, and there is what you also see is there is a sort of cross-fertilization, not only from Hong Kong into Shenzhen, but also uh, the other way around, which I think is hugely uh, interesting. And then I think um, Shenzhen, in a way, um, has the potential to become a sort of new, new town, uh, town 2.0, um, in a way, a sort of perpetual new town, because um, you know, it kind of keeps reinventing itself on a constant level. And maybe um, one could talk of a sort of special urban development zone uh, in the future of Shenzhen. Um, in any case, I think, and you know, everybody talks about Shenzhen as a new town, but I think the case of Shenzhen is relevant for the whole of China because, let's face it, let's face it all Chinese cities are, to a very large degree, new towns. Because um, if you see what the historic core is of, a, of a, an average Chinese city from the 80s and how big it is now, um, you know, the historic core is almost invisible in the, in the, in the overall context. And I think, in that sense, um, Shenzhen, what you see is already now at the, at the, at the forefront of, uh, of development. I think that will... Um, it will keep that edge over, over other cities because the problems just emo emerge earlier than in other cities. So what you see now is things hap that happen in Shenzhen start to happen in Shanghai. Um, and then they go to the second tier city. So it, it stays this laboratory of innovation for um, the whole of China. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Marcus. The plot thickens, the complexity increases. Uh, what you were actually uh, showing us was caring for the city, right? Um, yeah, probably. Yeah. You, you, um, you're it's still it's doubting it? it? It's a bit, it's a bit, it's just, uh, f from our perspective, often it's curiosity. Um, mm. And to, to, to see what you can do within an existing system and how far you can get in adding things on top. And sometimes that goes right, sometimes that goes wrong. Um, but for us, it's also a sort of constant experiment um, to see you know, can we try this, can we try that? Also with the hope that eventually it becomes uh, much more of a, of a habit to do it. For example, these workshops I was mm. talking about, yeah. 
um, when we meet this client now for everything he asks us, he says, yeah, but you're doing a workshop, right? Okay. Um, so it's become almost, you know, it's not formalized in the system, mm. but people have realized that there is a benefit in doing it. And I think a lot of things only start changing when you kind of keep practicing it for a certain period of time. But when you are saying that you that, that systems or more systems, no, maybe not systems are needed, is what you said, right? Well, is, is, isn't that <laughs> more about uh, filling filling a gap or or gaining freedom or something like that? I think, I th yeah, probably. I mean, what I what I showed is like you know the, the planning system clearly has deficits, and you have to find some solutions how you deal with these deficits. Either you you can say I don't address them, but then you know that you don't live, uh, we would not live out to up to our own ambition. Um, and I think the other is that, um, and this is a bit the discussion between is it top down or bottom up? I don't think it's either or. I think we see that it's a, it starts to be a much stronger combination between the two. Yeah. And what I think is hugely interesting is, you know, we are now in a time where um, somehow it's, it's not clear what that, what that exact relationship um, is and maybe we will, it will keep changing and will maybe the we have this friction also in the future um, and this constant readjustment readjust of, of you know who is in power and who is not right. and who is leading and who is not. I liked your phrase of the perpetual new town, the permanent laboratory of course, right. which makes us organizing and organize these uh, sessions are over and over of course. Um, but um, this, this I, I think we can rule out, maybe I'm a little ahead of conclusion, but I rule out the, the, the top down bottom up uh, uh, movement or whatever. Uh, uh, Organization, because I think uh, all of the three speakers have clearly shown that it's 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 different from that. It's it's a more intervening and and uh, interweaving actually of uh, of, uh, of of things. So um, nevertheless, we do come from a situation and we're going towards another situation. So there is there is certainly a certain um, movement, so to say. Yeah, you know, I'm not so sure whether we're coming from one situation and going to another situation. I think. Oh. You know, that's just a concept from standing here and saying there was something in the past, there's something in the future. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's actually everything is constantly changing, you know, and uh, and um, in a way. But yeah, but what about time and progress? Uh well, there is time and progress, but but you know, how do you define what what is what is progress? Then in this, in the, uh, you know, mm, that's a philosophical how do you, how do you one. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, mm. that that really kind of hits on a, on a point also how. Um, we see ourselves in time and how, for example, Chinese see, uh, see themselves in time. You know, mm. We see ourselves very much as static and you know, this is behind me, uh, this is the past and this uh. is the future. Yeah. Whereas the Chinese would much more kind of put himself into, into a sort of constant continuum of time mm. and, uh, and then you don't have this, uh, this discussion so much. Mm. Um, and um, so when, you're, when you define yourself as constantly moving, you're also kind of operating in a different way and I think you know, this is also a difference of concepts, you know, how, how, how we deal in, in Europe deal with the problems and how um, problems are dealt with in, uh, in China. We see a system and we have to change the system. Um, I, think, I think a lot of Chinese would think differently about that and would actually uh, not so much, they would see the system, but, you know, all the variations you're constantly working with are actually part of that, of that modus operandi that system actually has. Good. Can I invite you to, to take a chair? Um,